acknowledge the Lene Lenape Nation on whose traditional territory we are gathering. We recognize them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Sandy, can you please take the roll? Glenn LaPolt? Here. Diana Armstead? Present. Brian Knoyer? Here. Michael O'Donnell? Here. Bianca Tannis? Here. Teresa Thompson? Here. Matthew Williams? Here. Uh, and also, before we stand for the pledge, I would just like to say that uh, the BOE is going to uh, be without masks. We're all vaccinated, and we want to make it easier for, to be able to hear each other. We had some acoustical problems last meeting. Can we rise for the pledge? Okay, we have some agenda changes. For item 12.3, we are going to remove uh, Selena Velez's appointment. For item 12.5, we're going to remove, remove Selena Velez's resignation. And for item 12.7, we're going to change the effective date um, to 5-21-21 through 9-20-21. Can I have a motion to accept those changes? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. That's going to take us to item number four, the recognition of the salutatorian, Ms. Medina. This evening, it's my honor to recognize the achievement of our salutatorian, Rachel Rankin. Rachel has distinguished herself as a student through her academic achievements and strong commitment to pursue her interests. Rachel, Rachel was a member of the National Honor Society and is a National Merit Scholarship Commended Student. In addition to excelling academically, Rachel is an accomplished dancer, working both as a dancer and choreographer in the Barefoot Dance Company. When asked, Rachel credited her parents for helping her and always supporting her goals. Rachel, we have a small token to recognize your achievements as a student in the New Paltz Central School District. We'd like to invite Rachel up to receive this recognition. Congratulations, Rachel. That will take us to item number five, public hearing on the Code of Conduct. Ms. Butler. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, uh, the Code of Conduct uh, is worked on every year by the subcommittee of the um, PAC committee. Um, it started, the work on the uh, Code of Conduct goes on every year, but there was extensive work 
done for this particular version of the Code of Conduct because we went about trying to remove the punitive and legalese from the Code of Conduct so we could have a kinder, less punitive, and more caring Code of Conduct where we could lead students towards better behavior as opposed to being solely punitive. So that work was started when Sophia Skiles was the board member uh, on the committee. Connie Hayes um, was the uh, chair of the HAP committee until I came along and co-chaired with her, and I continued after Connie retired in January. So we worked on it uh, a great deal, got most of the process done, and then we had the pause, so we never had a chance to present it to the board. So we started working on it again this year. The committee, um, the committee received a, a copy of the code of conduct that we had worked on maybe about a month ago. Everybody viewed it on their own, and we came together in a meeting to determine if we needed any changes. So we all had extensive time to review it, and then I distributed it to the building leaders, all the principals, to find out if they were in need, if they felt that there was a need for any changes. We put a particular lens on it this time so that we could be mindful of any effects related to COVID. Did we need to change anything or amend anything that students might be in need of because of COVID? So after conversations and meetings and going back and forth, we determined that the code that was put in place was far superior to any uh, past codes because it took out all the punitive language. It focused on a culture of care and concern and collaboration. And we felt that we did not need to make any changes to the code of conduct moving forward this year. Are there any questions? Board members, do you have any questions? So, uh, not a question, but just clarification. So, did you, um, because I know you have a background in it and, and are familiar with it, um, language from restorative practices? Uh, right, um, from restorative practices, we took out anything that was punitive. Um, the only time we referred to a punishment was after all kinds of interventions would be tried. Those interventions did not work. Then we would talk about disciplinary consequence or punishment. But that was left until the very end after other things first would be exhausted. And so for, for, those, for that point where um, something of a punitive nature um, is in place, is it still or even better with um, a, you know coming from a learning process, meaning I understand what's punitive, but are they going to get something positive out of it? Well, the conversation uh, revolves around always, and everything that we do, what the principals do, what the teachers need to do, is to focus on what the student needs to learn in order to practice better behavior. So that's primary. That is always primary, and when we get to uh, training everyone in restorative practices, that will come out, because it is a change of mindset, it's a change of paradigm, it has to come from the top down, from administrators to teachers to staff to bus drivers and custodians, it has to come from the top down. It's more of a change in us, and less than a change of the children. We focus on us first. So we need to move forward with making sure that we have an atmosphere of, and a culture of care and concern so that we bring the students along to show them the behaviors that are acceptable. And then when there are behaviors that are not acceptable, we try to teach them what, ex what acceptable behaviors are and then compliment them when they start to take these behaviors on, at, on, them, on their own. So um, I'm looking forward to us being uh, a restorative district, and that's just going to take a certain timeline to get that, accomplished, to get that accomplished. But we did take all of that into account when we were working on the code of conduct. This was a very long process that started even before I started. Some of the people that you see here, I know Ann Sheldon was involved. A lot of other people were involved in working on the code of conduct for about three years to make these major, major changes away from a punitive document that only talks about if you do this, you're going to get that. If you don't do this, you're going to get that. To something that showed more of a collaboration for bringing students 
to a, through a learning process towards better behavior so that they can monitor their own and we model what it is they need to do to move forward. The word I was looking for that I forgot was teachable moment. So it's a teachable yes, moment. Yes, absolutely. Every opportunity to teach. I just want to say I appreciate all of her work that went into this, especially on the dress code. I know you guys worked on that a long time with yes. Sophia, and I know that took a lot of time and, yes. and effort. So, and that, that's a major think, part of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thank you so much because I think it reads so much better now, and it's perfect. Okay. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Anything else? Okay, thank you. I live in Westchester and it takes me an hour to get home, so I'm excusing myself. Go. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Drive safe. Thank you. Okay, that's going to take us to item number six public comment. We have three public comments this evening. The first up is Rebecca Masters.
a few of them really are interested and capable already in middle school for accelerated classes, while others, probably most, may not get that interest till high school, in which case they can take AP classes if they are so inclined and are interested in doing the work involved. My daughter did. I hope we can stop acting like accelerated classes are a guarantee of a lifetime of happiness or success. And as a special ed teacher, I hope we can recognize that there are many paths to happiness and success. And too often we hold up academics and college as the only measure, while other pathways like the trades are often ignored or dismissed. So again, I just had to put my last two cents in, and I don't think I talked about any union issues, so I'm okay. Um, <laughs> and again, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank the administrators for fighting through this year as crazy as it was, and the students and the parents and everybody who's been through this, and I hope the district has a wonderful future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for all your service, Mr. Masters. That takes us to another public comment. Uh, Eli Kazarir, I apologize if I pronounced that incorrectly. Eli. You were pretty close. Eli Kassira, Garden, New York. And I come here tonight really out of concern uh, for the children, for the students. I'm a parent myself, I have children. Uh, they're all older. I spent most of my life uh, as a teacher and also as a high school principal. So my heart is with the children and uh, I have to say, my heart really breaks when I see the kids with the masks on. I think it's become pretty clear that the masks are ineffective. Uh, the most recent study is the Danish study, it's out of the University of Copenhagen. It's really definitive and it's conclusive that, that masking is really ineffective and almost useless. Uh, beyond that, it appears as if damage and harm is being done to the kids emotionally, psychologically, uh, even physically in some cases. So it's really not just, it's just not a benign issue. It's uh, something that's causing harm and difficulty for the kids. And I would urge you to kind of re-examine the district's policy. I mean, in fact, uh, school-aged children rarely contract COVID when they do the symptoms are mild. Virtually, it's 100% recovery from that. As a matter of fact, more kids die from the flu, which is rare, than die from COVID. So it's really something that needs to be looked at hard. I just wanted to share this piece of information with you as well. Uh, in Germany, they actually set up a registry uh, regarding face mask wearing among German children, and doctors were asked to inform parents about the registry and report any impairments from masks. Oh, this was last October. And in just one week, is that feedback from this mic? Am I too close? Or it's the hum of the AC? Okay. In just one week, over 20,000 parents responded. And of those who responded, 68% reported impairments, including irritability, 68%, headache, 53%. Difficulty in concentrating, less happiness, reluctance to go to school, 44%. Malaise, impaired learning, and fatigue. Now granted, it's not a scientific study. It's just, it's anecdotal, but still 20,000 parents responded to this and indicated that a lot of their kids were having some serious problems as a result of the mask wearing. The second issue I wanted to talk about is the what I refer to as the experimental COVID-19 injections. Uh, I do not call them vaccines because by definition a vaccine is supposed to give you immunity from the disease and prevent the transmission of the disease. This injection does not give immunity, nor does it prevent the transmission. This is per the CDC. Um, and it's experimental because it is. It normally takes eight to 10 years to develop a vaccine which is considered to be safe and effective. This injection is not tested or approved, only has EUA, that's emergency use authorization. Sadly, this may be the biggest medical experiment in history. It even violates the Nuremberg Codes, which were established after World War II, to prevent and prohibit medical experimentation on humans without full informed consent. 
I just want to finish by saying that according to VAERS, that's the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, which is really run by the CDC and the FDA, in just four months, ending in April, there have been over 118,000 adverse reactions reported, including over 4,000 deaths and over 12,000 injuries. Now, I know there are questions about VAERS, but it's been used forever. As a matter of fact, back in 1976, when we had the swine flu epidemic, and they came out with a flu vaccine, after 53 deaths, they stopped giving that vaccine. Now, we have over 4,000 that we know about, and the deaths and the incidents that get reported to VAERS, statistics vary. People say between 1% and 10% actually get reported to VAERS. So only 1% or 10% actually get reported. So really, theoretically, instead of 4,000 deaths, it could be 40,000, it could be 400,000. We really don't know, but there are clearly some serious problems with it. And I guess I'm not here to knock the vaccines. If you want to get a vaccine, fine. I'm here to advocate for the choice that you give the parents, the families, the opportunity to choose if they want to vaccinate. If you want to vaccinate, that's fine, that's your business. If you want your children to be vaccinated, that's fine, that's your business. But I'm asking you please not to make it mandatory to allow people to have that freedom of choice. And I hope, I don't know, I could be speaking to deaf ears now. Uh, I don't know, you know, but uh, you folks here have the responsibility. Uh, you really are the authorities here in the school district it really falls to your lap in terms of what happens, in terms of the safety and the health of the children in the district. And I just hope, I don't want to sound like I'm preaching to you, I'm just worried, I'm concerned, I'm disturbed. And I just hope that you understand there is another, there's another narrative out there that doesn't coincide with everything we're being told by the CDC and the FDA and the World Health Organization. And just please keep a little bit of openness to, to another another way of looking at this, maybe another perspective, because what you're understanding and what you're believing now might not be the be-all, end-all. There are so many questions. I'm just, I'm begging you to just be open to hearing perhaps another narrative. I appreciate your listening to me. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment, Eli. The next uh, public comment is Kimiko Link. Good evening, board. Um, thank you for your commitment to the education and the well-being of our students. Um, as a government scientist uh, with 30 years experience in a federal regulatory agency, a member of a regulatory pediatric environmental health committee, and also having direct uh, experience with pharmacological adverse impacts and lifelong autoimmune disorders, I think I'm in a position of awareness uh, to have seen inadvertent regulatory missteps and unintended consequences. Um, I would like to request that the board consider hosting a public forum regarding um, upcoming policy decisions with respect to uh, mandatory vaccinations. I know that this board may not be in a position to uh, set policy for the state or the county, but I believe that uh, school boards do have a very strong voice in public opinion. And um, I think the science is not settled. Um, as a scientist, I know science is never settled. So it bothers me when people say that because the scientific uh, process is circular. And I just wanted to read the definition of the scientific process from the Oxford Dic Dictionary or the scientific method. A method or procedure that has characterized natural science since the 17th century consisting in systematic observation, measurement, and experiment and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. Criticism is the backbone of the scientific method. So I think we're in a position now where we're seeing uh, some public health decisions have been made and there are some adverse impacts. Um, I don't know how closely you've been watching this, but as a scientist, I read everything and watch everything as closely as I can. And we are seeing, um, as Eli mentioned, certainly uh, reports to bears. Um, but we are also, um, also independently of that, uh, there's recently in the NBC News in Connecticut has uh, just 
described that there were 18 uh, youth that were hospitalized, uh, all I think about four days after their second shot. There's also a CDC report investigating that that was in the New York Times, and the Israeli government recently, um, as I think today or yesterday, has said that there's pro probable cause between myocarditis and uh, the Pfizer injection. So our children are our future and our most uh, precious, precious gift in life. And I think in the rush to do something, we may be somewhat misguided in our approach. I think we need to step back and pause. I know that there's this zeal to get to this herd immunity percentage, but at whose expense? And is that really the best path forward? I think we have missed in a tremendous opportunity to just focus on very, very basic things in terms of public health, not just hand washing and wearing your face mask and not touching your face, but I think in genuine basics like getting enough sleep, drinking enough water, eating a good diet, making sure that your vitamin D levels are high because vitamin D has um, a deficiency has been linked to more severe COVID outcomes. So basic things like this, I think, are critically important, and yet we're not sending that messaging out there. Also, um, coming today to speak on this issue has been hard for me because um, I don't necessarily think that um, moving ahead with this vaccine program for young people is the, is the right step forward at this juncture, at least, especially not having had any long-term um, studies no medium-term studies. In fact, it was only uh, given emergency use for the 12 to 15-year-old group just a few weeks ago. So we don't even know. We have no idea what the summer may bring. But judging from the recent news reports, I'm very, very, very worried. And I don't think in this rush to get to a certain percentage of herd immunity, we should necessarily be looking to uh, use our youth um, to get to that point, especially, as I mentioned, their chances of having severe adverse impacts are, are, are virtually none. So I would rather us focus on the basics um, and improving immune health uh, and also encouraging discussion. So I'm requesting that the board uh, have some sort of public forum or some means of soliciting public feedback like you did with the survey on the vaccine clinics, which again, I don't think are a good idea. I think there are plenty of opportunities for pretty much anybody to get vaccinated at any point. Um, but I think that the, in so doing that the, the school district would be uh, implicitly almost encouraging it. And I think the school district needs to take, stay neutral on it and if, any, if anything, um, at least encourage public debate on it um, because the, the peer pressure that the kids are experiencing to just fall in line and do what all their friends are doing and just get vaccinated is immense. And that's just not right. I mean, the kids have experienced so much, so much this year, as you well know. And to have that on them now, and many kids have pre-existing conditions, they have autoimmunity, they may have had anaphylaxis, and for them to feel like outcasts or lepers because they're not getting vaccinated, I think is just wrong on so many different levels. So I encourage you to explore this issue more. I'm happy to share more information about it, and I think there does need to be a more balanced discussion of this that welcomes all opinions, because again, Science is a circular process, and I think our, our best path forward is when we try and encourage as many perspectives as possible um, in this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go back to item number five, and I'm going to call for a motion to ask for a motion to uh, pass the Code of Conduct. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.
It's going to take us to item number seven, the student representative report. It does not look like Samantha Juan Pan is here tonight, so that will take us to item number eight, the superintendent's reports and discussion items. Ms. Medina. Just a couple of updates uh, this evening. There was communication sent out today about high school graduation. We are down to one ceremony for the high school graduation on Friday, June 25th at 6 p.m. at the Floyd Patterson Field at the high school. <clears throat> there are two weather days also scheduled. Uh, if in the event that the 25th is uh, inclement, there is uh, a rain date or weather date scheduled for the 26th at 6, and if needed, uh, Sunday, June 27th at 11 a.m. One ceremony, all students, uh, two guests per student, and the tickets will be distributed to seniors at rehearsal on Wednesday, June 23rd. I know we're all looking forward to that day. Four of our high school seniors have created a mural that will be displayed at Peace Park in the village of New Palms. The students, Paris White, Reddy Patel, Alana Florencio Wayne, and Queen Irving, are all part of participation in government literature and economics for today's students, also known as Piglets. <clears throat> the mural a final pro is part of a final project, which also includes a discussion about the theme of the mural how the social justice issues <clears throat> depicted have impacted their lives. The discussion will take place Friday, June 4th at 4 o'clock in Peace Park. Last weekend, I had um, the opportunity to attend the high school production of Into the Woods. Have to give a big shout out to Nicole Cody and Nancy Owen for their leadership and the fantastic performances by a very talented high school cast. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. That's gonna take us to item number nine, board communications. Uh, for uh, Diana, would you like to? Sure, so I came up with the idea um, that the school board in and of itself should do a self-evaluation we're performing. Um, I guess the idea of an evaluation has been around for a long time, but it's not mandatory. Uh, but I think when we are in the position that we are in, that we should self-examine ourselves. And so I think uh, in the packet, I just checked with Sandy, so the packet is on our uh, computers at home, but she's gonna print them for me tomorrow so we don't have to go through all that kind of thing. And we can have a discussion on it, hopefully, maybe next week. We can talk about it, look over the, look over the um, evaluation, and maybe have some discussion. Um, a lot of that information, too, has been coming in through the NISBA um, newspaper, I call it. And I'm, I'm thinking that we all get it. I don't know if we all do or if we don't, yeah. but it, it is loaded with a ton of information in terms of, of how a board should be functioning, um, what we should and what we likely should not be doing. Um, so I think we should, if, if you have those, go through them so that we can really have an engaging and um, interesting conversation about the self now. I'd like to, for us to do that before the new term comes in for you know, the next um, group of, uh, of board members. So that's just my little on that. So this is due uh, for the next public meeting. You would like to have a discussion? Um, we can, sure, how about you Sounds great. Board members, you have any uh, questions about this, Dan? I think it's an outstanding idea. I think it's an outstanding idea. Agreed. Board members, would you have, a, do you have anything you guys would like to add? Oh, sounds great. Where, where Diana, it's in the, it's in the shared drive? Um, it's, it came in the packet for yeah. today. Is it, it was at home? Yeah. It was, it, uh, it must, maybe was it added after the first? 
I'll have to go back and look. I don't have questions. But you know what? Don't forget it's probably Leslie. I'll, I'll have a copy for you. It's, it's right after the code of conduct in the packet, so it's very brief. Yeah. yeah. It's from, it's, it's, it's from, or you can, it's on NISDA's website. Yeah. NISDA, yeah. yeah. stuff that I should But don't print it, because that, that'd be a lot of print. Thank you, Diana. I, I just, should we, I mean, I just was briefly looking over it, but isn't it something maybe that we should discuss, like, in maybe a workshop that we have private? That's not what I was thinking about. Okay, yeah. that sounds great. I was thinking instead of, like, having that conversation in public, like, having a workshop first and talking about it together. Okay. And I'm thinking that that's yeah. why I said next okay. week. So we can maybe cut in a little bit of time for that? The Wednesday yeah. meeting? And then we can discuss okay. it publicly. Yeah. Okay. Sounds yeah. great. But do we have, you mean, um, after our meeting on Tuesday? Whatever, the meeting that we have on the... Or on, on the Wednesday after our... Okay. We have one on the Wednesday. Nine. We have one on the Wednesday. Yeah. Isn't that... We have a meeting on the eighth and the ninth. We could carve out a little time. Well, the, the eighth is that meeting. The ninth, the Wednesday meeting. Oh, and then what's the ninth? The workshop. Workshop meeting. Either. Oh, okay. Oh, right, right, right. Gotcha. Right. Okay. So put it in there. Absolutely. And again, I think it's a great idea. I really do. Thank you for bringing that up. All right. That's going to take us to item number 10, committee reports. First up, we have Mike O'Donnell on the audit committee. Our last audit committee meeting, we met with the internal auditor. The internal auditor looks over our internal processes and systems make sure that they're running efficiently and also at that meeting we chose an area of internal focus to review on so the auditors will be coming in to review that i can't state publicly what it is because it's supposed to come as a big surprise to the uh, administration of the district so uh, i believe they might have been in this week or maybe today so it's already underway the internal audit and we will get the results uh, we might have to have another audit committee meeting by the end of June when we will receive the report from the internal audit. Okay, thank you, Mike. That's going to take us to Brian and the policy committee. Policy committee. Thank you, Brian. And uh, Teresa, facilities? Um, we didn't meet last month. We had to cancel for a uh, board thing, but I would, uh, planning on meeting, hopefully, well, definitely over the summer. Um, before September. Um, I think it's important that we get together and, and you know, discuss what um, the building situation is going to look like um, coming back to uh, school in September. So um, I'm going to send out an email to all the committee members and see if we can pick a date, either like maybe July or August, to get together. Sounds great. Thank you, Teresa. That will take us to Bianca and the Legislative Action Committee. The Legislative Action Committee uh, will not meet again until after the reorg meeting in July. Okay, thank you. Uh, Diana, react? Um, yes, uh, we did not meet, but I just want to give you an update in that uh, we are going to be looking for new students to join react. Um, and actually, react is busy working on the dynamics for the meeting for next week on the end. Okay, thank you. That will take us to item number 11, minutes of the meeting. Can I have a motion to accept the minutes of the uh, May 19th, 2021 meeting, business meeting? So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. That will take us to item 12, personal consent agenda. Can I have a motion to accept items 12.1 and 12.2? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. All right, this takes us to item 12.3. A recommendation of the New Paul Central Schools Board of Education upon the recommendation of Angela Irvina Medina, Superintendent of Schools, does hereby submit the following non-instructional appointments. Aaron Metzger, School Monitor, effective 525-2021. So Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
when is this all a consent agenda going through? No. Yeah. Was that motion passed 12 7 0? That's going to take us. Uh, can I have a motion to accept item 12.4? Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed 7 0. Item 12.4, 12.5. Recommendation that the New Paul Central Schools Board of Education, upon the recommendation of Angela Arvina Medina, Superintendent of Schools, does hereby accept the following non instructional substitute resignation. So we for Caitlin Dietz. Substitute school bus driver and Judy Ravona, Meshes substitute school nurse. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. That will take us to item 12.6, the non instructional resignation for the purpose of retirement. The recommendation of the New Paul Central Schools Board of Education upon the recommendation of Angela Arvina Medina, Superintendent of Schools, does hereby accept the following resignation for the purpose of retirement. Walter Huntoon, school bus driver of 39 years. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Enjoy your retirement. He might have been your driver's one. <laughs> I mean, if we do the math, which I can, but <laughs> I think that puts us somewhere in the early 80s. I actually might have been on Walter's bus. Walter, I'm sorry, I acted up on that bus, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, wow. Do I have a motion to accept? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Congratulations on that retirement, man. Can I have a motion to accept item 12.7? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Can I have a motion to pass item 12.8? So Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Takes us to item 12.9, instructional resignation for the purpose of retirement. Recommendation of the New Falls Central Schools Board of Education upon the recommendation of Angela Arvina Medina, Superintendent of Schools, does hereby accept the resignation of the following instructional employee for the purpose of retirement. Don Bartlett, social studies teacher of 28 years. Wow. He's going to coach all the <laughs> Was that a second, Matt? Oh, okay. Discussion. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. Enjoy. You will clearly be missed. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Can I have a motion to accept items 12.10 to items 12.14? So second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item passes 7-0. That will take us to uh, number item 13, old business. We have the third reading of policy 7680, the independent educational evaluation. Make a motion. Second. Everything. Uh, Discussion. I, I know you have it. No, yeah, the, the language um, changes, I think, um, address my concerns that just so the language changes clarify to you that, um, that when parents are seeking an independent education evaluation, that the criteria have to be similar, but not exactly the school district. So it's not, it's, it's not as limiting as, or it doesn't appear to be as limiting as it originally sounded. Thank you. Any other discussion? No, I agree this, this allows for the reasonable amount of leeway in terms of especially application and that we're heavy. Agreed. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. That will take us to new business, item 14.
Item 14.1, request for approval of the Committee on Special Education Recommendations and Student Placements. Recommendation that the following resolution be approved, be resolved, and the Board of Education of the New Paul Central School District approve the Committee on Special Education and the Committee on Preschool Special Education and Recommendations of Student Placements. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item passes 7-0. Item 14.2, request for approval of automotive diesel fuel bid. Be it resolved that the New Paul's Board of Education award the diesel fuel bid to Botini Fuel for marketeer differential prices of 0 0.0110 for premium diesel and 25 cents for kerosene. Can I have a motion to accept item 14.2? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item passes 7-0. Takes us to item 14.3, acceptance of donation. It's a recommendation that the New Paul Central Schools Board of Education, upon the recommendation of Angela Urbina Medina, Superintendent of Schools, does hereby accept a donation of $1,612.95 from Show Ticks for You on behalf of parents and community members who decided to donate ticket refunds to the High School Musical Club. Can I have a motion to accept that? So moved. Second. Discussion? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item passes 7 0. Thank you. This takes us to item 14.4 acceptance of donation. The recommendation that the New Paul Central Schools Board of Education, upon the recommendation of Angela Medina Medina, Superintendent of School, Schools, does hereby accept a donation of 56 facial tissue packets and 110 packages of 10 hand sanitizing wipes, valued at $200, from Walgreens Pharmacy of New Paul's. Can I have a motion to accept that donation? Second. Discussion? Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Walgreens. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. That's going to take us to item 14.5. Be it resolved that the New Paul Central School District, upon the recommendation of Angela Urbina Medina, Superintendent, does hereby approve the agreement between the New Paul Central School District and TransFinder for transportation software licenses hosting services, training, and support in the amount of $21,380 for the first year of the contract and $6,550 for contract, contract renewal commencing one year from initial activation date and authorizes the assistant superintendent for business to execute the contract. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? I have one question. Is this a are we going to a different software? Yes, the current program that we use, uh, Versatran, the company has um, moved away from the software package that we currently use, and what they are moving towards doesn't suit the district. So um, TransFinder works well, but which is fortunate because there aren't really any other players um, in that space. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sharifa. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. The motion passes 7-0. It's going to take us to item 15, other discussion. Do we have any discussion? I have just one question. Teresa. Um, last year, uh, we sent, the board sent out thank you letters to the students who helped serve on our committees. Um, we probably won't do that again, right? Um, I think so. So, yeah. I just, I, I, because I wrote them, so um, I think we just, Diana, if you can give me the, um, Students, or just send me an email to students that are on React, and we also have Samantha, and is that it? We didn't have any, usually we have a couple people on Hack, but that didn't meet, right? Um, there were no students on, on Hack. Not this year, Hack did not meet this year other than the code of conduct. Can I get a picture of any other students that assisted us on the board? Just the React students Samantha. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Board members, does anybody have any other discussion? I just wanted to mention, just to ask um, what everybody thinks about public comment now that we're meeting in person. 
If people cannot attend and give public comment, one of our options is that people can email their comment to the board clerk and it can be printed out and left with the agenda um, rather than having the board clerk read it out during the meeting. And I think, and I don't know, I guess it can be attached to the minutes when they come out, right? If it's done that way. And I'm just wondering if that's something we want to consider moving to so that we have written copies of, of those public comments. Well, I think with this has come up this year, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I think that we have to read the comment into, into the record, the board president or the clerk. Our policy says that they, that they, they can be printed and left with the agenda. They don't have to be read out loud during the meeting. And I think sometimes the other public comments are not part of the agenda. It says their name. Okay. So then it wouldn't be available for people. The only way people could see it is if they came to the meeting. Or well, they can watch the video. If it's ready for the public record. Right. You know, that was a, a question in terms of, I think we should visit, it's probably written somewhere, um, the type of comments that are permissible to be written on or to be read depending on the content. I don't think we don't we don't have that choice. We can only not if we have we have a, according to our, our policy we can choose to have public comments read by the district clerk if they're if they're not in person or printed and put with the agenda when people walk in. We have two we have two options, but we can't censor the content. We can only follow our policy. So if somebody is being named in the comment, um, if it's specific to personnel or names of student. You know, anything that violates our, our public comment policy, but otherwise, we have to read them all. Unless we decide that we want to have it printed and left with the agenda. So basically, uh, you're, we're asking to either A, read the comments into public record, or B, print them and put them with the agenda for people as they walk in so they can read them themselves. I just want to have a clear policy now that we're moving from COVID era where it was put into the portal, now we're back in person. I just want to have a clear a clear protocol for how we're doing this and then communicate that out to the public. I think that's a valid yeah. answer. I mean, it's fairly clear in the policy that it's really up to the board president at their discretion. So you can submit a, a comment in writing to the district clerk. I'll just, I'll just read the passage. Okay. Individuals that cannot attend a meeting in person may submit their comment in writing to the district clerk. The individual may request that the district clerk read their comment aloud at the meeting. To the extent practicable, the district clerk will do so. Comments that identify a person by name or position will not be read aloud. Comments will not be read until all in-person speakers have had their opportunity to address the board. The district reserves the right to redact any inappropriate material from the submitted comment. The board president may, at their discretion, have a printed copy of each submitted comment available at the meeting for public review in lieu of having the district clerk read the comment aloud. So, what defines inappropriate? Well, I mean, you can look at open meeting law opinions and get all the different ranges of interpretation, but for the most part, um, there's very little that is inappropriate. The only thing that really would be considered inappropriate is something that wasn't wasn't reasonably related to the school district business. You know, like if somebody wanted to come up and read from the phone book, you know, like as a sort of pseudo filibuster, you could just say, no, that's not, that has nothing to do with school district business, you don't get to comment, right? It's not a, uh, there aren't laws or rules. I mean, we could have no public comment at all if we wanted to, so there aren't, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of gray area in there, but generally, generally we have a lot of leeway also to define through policy what is and is not allowed. I think we should use our discretionary because, well, you know, during this past academic year, there was uh, a good amount of negative, I mean, nasty negative stuff. And then there was some stuff that was complimentary that didn't get read. So it, it leaves, you know, that, that, that I don't know. I think it should be one, one flat policy for all non in public comments because I think if we get into a really dangerous area if we start deciding which ones will be read out loud and which right. ones the won't. First amendment. Right, but this is the thing. That's what happens, though. Some get read and some don't. So, so, so that's okay. I would like a, a, just a protocol of what we do. If you're not in person, you submit a public comment, 
either we read them all out loud or we have them all printed with the agenda. I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm not, I'm just proposing to choose one or the other. But we did right. read everything out loud. Well, during COVID, we had to. Yeah, we did. Ten meetings. But now that we're in person, I think I just want to look at that and right. say which direction are we going to go. Well, wouldn't we go back to what is happening right now, where people are coming to the meetings, and if they have public comment, but, then they can. But the policy still says that they can send a comment in writing. Yeah, and it was like that before COVID. Right. We, just we people that just didn't do it. I mean, very often. It, it, it was done a couple of times. A few right. times, I remember. Yeah. And I remember a few times we, we did have it printed out, but it was very rare. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, can, can we just go back to what we had before? Where people well, I, can think, I think we do, we do have the risk of having, you know, because people are now used to not attending in person. I mean, I guess, do we want to encourage in-person participation? Yeah. Um, in that case, I think that if you want to make a comment and read it to the board, you have to come in person. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to encourage, like, you know, starting in September, in person, people coming back to our meetings and feeling comfortable coming back to the meetings. So but, that, but our current policy allows for the written comment. So right. if we're so we'd, we'd, we'd have to change the policy for that to be a change. I think right now it's allowed. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, it's allowed. Yeah, I think what Bianca is saying, which I agree with. I think we should just decide what we're going to do. So one week we're reading them, the next week we're printing them. That right. Like that, we can always have written written comments. The question is, do we read them all into the public? Do we read them all out loud at the meeting, or do we have printed copies at the front? Those are our two options, and I think we should pick a uniform option. And it shouldn't be like discretionary. It should be across the board. Yeah, we don't want anybody. Okay, we're dead. Yeah, we don't want because anybody saying, "Oh, you read." these five comments, but you didn't like what mine said, so you printed it and put it in the agenda. Yeah, no. I mean, so we should we just make the decision that either A, we're going to read all the comments, or B, we're going to print all the comments and put them in the agenda. I think we should just do what we did before, which was the very rare ones that we did get, where we read by Dusty and, you know, now Sandy. I'd argue that the policy says we Right, it said to the extent practical, the district clerk will do so. So as long as it is practical, then we should read it. Right, which means that if we get 30 of them, obviously we're not going to have poor Sandy reading 30. Well, yes, yeah, so also, also I'll do another part of That we should set a threshold, right? So, yeah. so I, don't, I don't think it should be on a case-by-case -case basis. We should say if we get more than four, we print them. Or we I agree with you. Yeah, that's, that's fine, but yeah. it shouldn't be arbitrary. We should set a threshold. I mean, right. we're going to start right. getting more public comments, I would think but via email because we've done it for 15, 16 months. So we have to be clear, you know, mm -hmm. how many emails are we gonna read out loud? So we gotta establish a threshold, but 10, five? Well, we have a provision in here that also allows, I mean, we do have to allow some discretion here, in my opinion. So the board president shall have the authority to curtail public comment if in their judgment the continuation or commencement of the comment period threatens to obstruct the conduction of business. The decision to curtail public comment must be viewpoint neutral. So meaning that you can't, we could curtail public comment in some way by saying we're only gonna allow 30 minutes of it, or we're only gonna read X number of comments. What you can say is like, we're gonna pick and choose the ones we want out loud and the ones we don't. Or the ones we will allow, the ones we won't. But, and this really there is to prevent, so, so let's say, let's say that people just wanted to completely derail me. They got together a campaign and said, let's just send in 50 10-page public comments and make them readable. We don't have to do it. That's what that's there for. We could say, no, it's too much. We're not going to read it. So if it out, that's fine. But we're not going to we're not going to allow public comment to threaten what we're really here to do, which is conduct business. So then the board, the we could print all the comments. They could be on, attached to the agenda and at the meeting. If there's a lot of, like, depending on how many there are or how many people have signed up, the board president can say, we are not going to be reading any electronic comments tonight. Sure. I, I would say that's not viewpoint neutral, though. Yeah, no, that's, it should that's, be. I want to make sure that we're viewpoint neutral, which I guess is, 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 would be the purpose of setting a threshold, right? Like the first X number that come in. So we're not picking and choosing. We can timestamp them and say the first five that come in. Um, you know, I just, I, because otherwise I think it's, it's difficult to ensure neutrality. I think the easiest way to handle this is to put a time limit on public comment. 
and you prioritize the people who come in person. And once the people who come in person are done, then you can read whatever written comments we've gotten until the time of this. In time, yeah, it's a quarter. Listen, if you have a, a really important topic that you're passionate about, come to the meeting. Yeah. I mean, I've done it before. What, you know, what, time limit, right? yeah. what, are, what are you guys thinking for our time limit? Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily agree on the time limit. So I think the spirit of the policy is really, the spirit of the policy is two things. One, if somebody wants to comment, they get to comment that there. Okay? We just allow it to be point neutral. They don't get to mention people by name, they don't get to mention people by position, but they get to speak. And the second part is, there is, there is a limit there in that if the amount of public comment threatens that we won't be able to get through our agenda in a reasonable amount of time, then we get to make adjustments or changes or curtail the limit. So, the reason I don't think a time limit is necessarily appropriate is because we have some meetings where we know we have a good idea of maybe two, three hours of agenda content that we have to get through then obviously that allows much less time for extensive public comment. If we've got a particularly light meeting, then we can allow more time for public comment, right? Because then we can't, I think then we can, we cannot reasonably justify that by reading all the comments prevents us from conducting our business. I, I mean, I, would, I certainly agree with that. People that come to the meeting, I shouldn't shut down the comments. They should be able to say something. I do think that the spirit of, you know, the policy is, it's up for too much interpretation. One person's spirit is another person's, you're silencing me. I mean, I think it should be clearer about five public comments via electronic email or I just print. think too, if you have people who come, you know, to, if you have 50 people who come and want to speak on one subject and one person who wants to speak on something else, you know, you also, you know, that, that person may not get their public comment, so at least it encourages people. If 50 of you feel the same way, like maybe come together and write a letter together, or I don't know. I just think that that before, though. I mean, I know Michael, when he was president, we had, he would be like, you know. No, I, I've, been, I've been in the audience when we had people. Yeah, yeah where it's, it's like, does anybody comment? have something else to comment on besides this issue where 30 previous people have commented on? I just so want to be able to give the community like a clear, you know, if you want to submit a public comment in writing, submit it by this time on this day. Uh, you know, we will read them, you know, to the extent possible. If not, they'll be printed and left with the agenda. I just want to be very clear so that as issues arise, the board is not left in a position of having to make judgments about what to read at that night or things that can be misconstrued as not being neutral. Um, Do we have to print them out? With every agenda that we print out, though, I mean that could be time consuming. It just says it just says it needs to be printed and available for public review at the meeting. So I think you just have to print one copy, and put it perhaps on the desk where the agendas are handed out, and people okay. can read them but then leave them. Okay. And they can be published in the electronic minutes. I think the problem there again with electronic minutes is like we've seen we'll get some of these comments right up until our meeting starts. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think we should have a, 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 a time. A time we have to use it by this time on this day. And just be very clear about it so that people aren't saying, I submitted a comment. It wasn't read or it wasn't received or printed. You know, I just think that the more, the clearer we can be, the, the better it will be for the community and board in terms of communication. So is this an ask for the policy committee to review and make a I think it's protocol that the board has developed. And we can revisit this. I just wanted to raise it. I think it's a protocol that can be developed by the board and communicated out. You know, the protocol based on the policy. Do you, maybe, do you want me to come up with something and we can all, you know, agree on it or, you know, pick it apart or whatever? Um, yeah, just based on what we just stated tonight, I can write something up. I think it has to be a public we can adopt it. Well, yeah, we can also at the next public board meeting uh, maybe put it under board comments for some public discussion. Yeah, do it a lot for a week. Yeah, I mean, just thinking if we wrote something up and we all agreed on it, we could say we're adopting this for the 2021-22 school year. Well, we, we do have a box under public comment right now that has sort of the protocol is laid out, so that's where we can put that. Oh, right, yeah. I think the, you know, the, the policy as it is is fine. It's, it's 
clear as it's as clear as it needs to be. Oh yeah, the box, right? We should, we've changed that a couple of years ago too. Right. We can change it again. Whatever we decide to do. I just think that now that post COVID, it's very easy for someone to flood the board with 50 or 100 comments on one topic, which interferes with the board's ability to do business and also, you know, might push out other voices. And I don't think that we should. I don't want us to begin making judgments based on the content. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, I will also add that it's a lot of pressure on the board president, whoever that person is, because these comments very likely are not coming in until the afternoon of the meeting. So everybody's getting ready, they're getting home from work, and all of a sudden the board president is watching the comments pile up, and all of a sudden it's on the board president's shoulders to make the decision on what's disruptive to the meeting, what's appropriate, what, you, you know, so, and then, you know, it's, there's not time to discuss this with other board members and you necessarily have to make a before the meeting, so you're making a judgment on it. So as board president, between my two and my what we, you know, when you did it, Michael and Glenn, would you prefer, I mean, we probably should put a, a cap on when it comes in. <laughs> like, not, right. not while you're sitting here, things are still right. coming in. Like, I, I would think, you know, they should be in 24 hours before the meeting. Oh. Yeah, or the afternoon, the day of the meeting. Well, I mean, I would also argue that if we're posting the public agenda the day of the meeting, it doesn't give people much time to submit a comment based on the agenda. So, you know, it, it might have to be that we post the agenda the day before, or that, you know, that the cutoff time be that day by 4 p.m. or something. I'm... It's supposed to be the before. Okay, so then we could say, you know, by 10 a.m. the day of the meeting, or... Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I'm just throwing time down. I don't have a particular... Like, but just by, something that by noon the day time to look at the agenda. You know, you don't get it in by noon. You know what? But if you don't get it in, and again, you feel that strongly about speaking, come to the meeting and speak that night. You know, there's two public comments. I mean, there's one in the beginning of the meeting, one at the end of the meeting. So if somebody's working late or whatever, they know they can come, at, you know, midway before a meeting and, and still have a chance to speak. I mean, I think we're very generous with our public comment policy. That we have to. Regardless, we will read all of them. I mean, I guess that's my point too. Is that you know, if they're printed, we will read all of them. It's not a ma it's not that the board won't read them. It's just the question of how you know the amount of time that they take up during a public meeting. Yeah, certainly, there's never been a public comment sent to us that we ourselves haven't read, right. despite not being read out loud in the meeting. But also, what Michael said in terms of you know. The, the abundance, if there's an abundance, and then it's going to interfere with the order of business. Yeah, and that came up this year. Remember, we got a bunch of public comments submitted through the portal at a meeting. There was maybe 20 of them. They were all similar, and in some cases, nearly identical in terms of copy and paste of content. And I mean, Glenn brought it to all of us. We said, we'll read them, but we're not going to read them all out loud. Yeah, that's going to that's that's, threaten our ability to do the business for that debt, and that's why that's in the policy. But that's that kind of that was on, you know, that created problems, like the fact that we are so wasn't hammered down on exactly what it was, and it created problems with you know people wanting access to it. You know, Sandy was involved, I was involved. There was a lot of work that went into that. And that was what I'm saying, like all of a sudden it's on the board president this side. On the fly. On the fly, what's happening? So that's what I'm saying, why don't we make a, a document saying these are the parameters, have it concrete, we all adopt it, and that's it. That's what we move forward with for next year. Which is gonna be a great year, by the way. No one's gonna have any criticism. So maybe, I mean, <laughs> I just, you know, in keeping with open meeting law, maybe a group of us, a subset of the board, could work on a draft and present it to the rest of the board. Yeah, the perfect. Meeting. Did that, that, I love um, it. Yeah, that's that so, enough. Would anybody here love to be on that subset of the board to look into that? Um, I mean, I'm the one who opened my mouth, so. <laughs> so I'll do it with Bianca, yeah, if anybody else You guys to can us. craft some stuff up, sure. take a crack at it, and we can take a look at it? Yeah. Great. How's that sound with other board members? Sounds like an ad hoc committee. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to be on it? You can set that to your own. Yeah. <laughs> so, quick suggestion. 
does this want to be adopted after the end of this month so the two new board members coming on board have a say? I'm okay with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. We, can, we can use it for the, you know, starting of the next school year. Yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. All right. So it's Therese, anybody else? Therese and I, anybody else want to? Michael, <laughs> 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 I think Brian said yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Brian, yay! I'm reluctantly going to have to pass to be on that. So. <laughs> 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 I don't want to be on an ad hoc committee with us. I would love to be there. I would. I know. I know. Sure. Let me know if you can help. Of course, I'm always here to help. Any other questions? All right. Uh, we don't have any other executive session, correct? Could I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Okay, oh, hey, Greg. Yes, sorry. I'm not, that's what I was saying. I just wanted to comment on 12.9 and publicly thank Mr. Hartley. Um, incredible. It's a word I can come up with. Um, it is dedication to students unmatched and will be a big loss for the district. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I, you know, I would say I agree. I, I've seen Don uh, teach and in speci uh, specifically I've seen him mold kids through coaching because he was coached with my wife for many years and I was very, very impressed. And, you know, a rare individual comes along that truly could shape and mold kids and guide them. And I was astounded. He was a master teacher and coach. Yeah. I mean, the student, how many students he's coached swim and, and track is just incredible. Yeah. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Seven zero. Thank you.